I was no great mathematician growing up, uh, was really struggled with math, and yet music helped me understand math. And you find, especially when you're pulling apart great pieces like Beethoven and Mozart wrote, Bach was another one that I really woke up to. When you started seeing uh, the construction of these masterpieces, you couldn't help, even from a, a math ditz like me, seeing how math plays into everything from the time signature to the rhythm of the piece. And I just found a whole rhythm in that that really helped me first and foremost as a writer. Uh, when I first got in the advertising world, I just found that there's a rhythm to everything, including really good writing that I'm always still trying to, to master in this day. And you know, the great masters of writers all have the rhythm to them. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you are in marketing, you are an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. And welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm glad you're listening in on this episode because we hear from a podcaster, a brand story strategist, a keynote speaker, and a storyteller extraordinaire, Park Howell. Park is the president of Park & Company, a Phoenix-based brand consultancy that has ignited the growth of purpose-driven clients for more than 20 years. Uh, they used the, the proprietary story cycle process to create abundance for the greater good. I love it. I love it. I love it. He's also done some, some teaching at uh, Arizona State that he talks about. He also has an amazing podcast called The Business of Story, which uh, connects business leaders and communicators with top story artists, authors, screenwriters, and others. And he's among the top business podcasts over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Park is just a good guy, a great storyteller, and have a wonderful conversation that I think will shed a lot of light on storytelling and help listeners just like you uh, tell their, a better story. So as we get into that conversation today, it's a friendly reminder to visit the storytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, uh, how to contact me if you want, send me a note, tell me what you love about the show. Uh, and you can also find other resources, actually like Parks stuff, to help you better tell your story. And if you're new, be sure to text the word storytellers to 31996 to subscribe and, uh, and share away as well. Now, let's get to the stories. <music> So thanks for joining me today, Park. I do appreciate you taking time to uh, teach the Storytellers Network listeners a little bit about the business of story, as it were. Oh, Dan, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, now, as we were talking beforehand a little bit, kind of getting uh, warmed up here, I mentioned that I often tell the listeners that this show is meant to be a little inspirational, a little behind the curtain. If you want to tell a better story, go listen to, to your show, to Park Howell's The Business of Story. Um, so I look forward to kind of giving them a little bit of insight, but looking also behind the curtain on what you do. So thanks for what you do for storytellers, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it's a, just a personal curiosity of mine. I think it probably dates back to when I was just a little kid and I learned how to play the piano because my grandmother would sit down and play the piano. And it used to blow me away when I was just a little tiny dude. And I go, I want to do that. And so my folks got me a piano when I was th what, third grade and started taking lessons. But I loved it so much, Dan, that um, I wrote a lot of music as a kid, just goofy stuff. Just, I just loved writing it, not thinking anything about it. And then I went on to get a degree of music in music, composition and theory, again, figuring I wasn't going to make a living at it. I was just personally really fascinated by the architecture and what goes into structure of music of all kinds that makes it work. And so that was many, many years ago, got in the advertising marketing world because I figured I could make a dime doing that, maybe not as a composer. Um, but I found that what I learned as a composer taught me a lot about what it, it, I could apply it in writing and brand strategy and that kind of thing. And then about 2006, when I, our world in the advertising, traditional advertising marketing world just stopped working as technology took over and the masses became the media. Um, I started studying storytelling and story structure, and it completely 
uh, relinked me with my past of music composition and theory. I saw unbelievable perils, uh, parallels between both and started applying then this framework to storytelling that completely and utterly fascinated me. Uh, it worked really, really well, and I loved it so much. I got out of the traditional advertising agency world and have now the last several years focused solely on consulting, teaching, coaching, and speaking about how to use story and be an intentional storyteller if you want to rise above the noise and be heard in this loud, loud, loud world we live in. Right. I just was talking about that today at a presentation about rising above the noise. Can you really rise above it? Can you join the conversation? What do you do? So now, yeah. so what you said, Park, about, about the, the traditional advertising changing, do you see it completely out the window now? I mean, can traditional advertising and, and marketing do anything anymore or is story what sets you apart? Well, you know, it, it certainly can. And there's still a lot of good agencies that can make it work, but to a man and to a woman in those agencies, they are telling better stories. And the reason why is our brain, our monkey limbic system brain still uses story to make sense out of the madness of being alive. So as our frontal cerebral cortex and its brilliance can grow our communication ability like, like Moore's law, where it just compounds, we can cram more information in more time and shoot it out to the world, the recipients, our audiences, are still trying to process all of that through that old apparatus that our homo sapien ancestors used to stay alive in the savannah 30,000 years ago. And yet, the one thing we have in common with them and where we are today is the fact that we use story, narrative, intentional narrative to make meaning out of the madness of, of being a human being. So if you want to cut through, don't just try to throw whistles and bells and this and that out there to try to be clever. Go back to traditional stories, story structure, setup, problem, resolution. You can do it in uh, 240 characters or less, um, and you will connect and hook that limbic system in your audience and they'll lean into you and actually listen to what you have to say. So do you think that you can tell an effective story through social media, through that 140 characters, through an Instagram photo, through what we have at our fingertips, or is that more of the promotion vehicle for real stories? Well, it's your trailer, I suppose, to get them hooked in to maybe go a little bit deeper. And of course, Dan, it, it just depends on what you're trying to do with your social media. Um, but what, who was it? Uh, Hemingway that wrote the six word story. What is it? I'm going to get this wrong, but it's like uh, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Yep. You know, six That's words, set a problem resolution. And you're like, what the, and that begs you to look a little bit deeper. Well, you could certainly do that with a tweet. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You know, um, you have a lot more words than that to work with, with a tweet. You can do it um, with the kind of imagery that you use on Instagram. So instead of just a selfie, a narcissistic selfie that you're throwing out there, think about is there a single frame that you can capture that tells a story about something that's going on that ignites that storytelling mechanism in our brains. It's like, oh, check this out. It invites the viewer into your world to experience something more than you just standing in front of your camera with a sunset in the background. So right. it's thinking about visual storytelling, short soundbite snippet storytelling on, on Twitter. And really social media is, is such a blur. It goes by so fast that you have to think set up problem resolution enough to hook them into clicking into something deeper. If you're going to take them to a website or a podcast or a blog or whatever. Yeah. Now, so the connection to cavemen, I want to get back to that a minute. Um, <laughs> you, you, uh, you're talking about what, what connects us, what makes us similar is that story. What is it, do you think, or maybe you know this through research, I mean, I know you do a ton of it. What is it that does connect us to our, you know, prehistoric or historic ancestors of, of story? How, how has story made a difference to us over the years so it's so imprinted in our DNA? Yeah, uh, just finished an absolutely fascinating book where the, the first half of this book covers this called Sapiens and uh, highly recommend it to anybody that wants to look back on just 
the overall cult, cultural development of us homo sapiens, but in it, they talk quite a bit about, if you think about this, homo sapiens have been around for about 160,000 years and mostly hanging out in Africa at that point. About 60,000 years ago, started evolving, started uh, immigrating out and into Eurasia and, and other places. Um, and we would come up against our other uh, hominids, you know, our, the Neanderthals in particular, and yet the, 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 the Neanderthals were bigger, stronger, more brutish. They may have been faster. They had actually larger eyes so that they could see better in the dark because they were more up in Northern Europe. And as Homo sapiens made their way up North and came across these more dominant beings physically, you would think the Neanderthals would win out, but Homo sapiens virtually eradicated. You know, I mean, we are the most aggressive in, in invasive species of all species ever known. The human beings, Homo sapiens, literally are. And what they looked at when they studied the anthropology of this, a Neanderthal's brain is the exact same size, if not in some cases, maybe a little bit bigger than a Homo sapiens. But the Neanderthal's brain was to work, to, were more about bodily functions, more animalistic in that respect. Homo sapiens were the very first animal, and make no mistake, we're animals, that were able to anticipate something that could happen tomorrow, which is fiction. It's a total story fiction. It's an imagined reality, and we were able to, through our more advanced language, to share those fictional stories with our fellow Homo sapiens. So when we would go into battle against the Neanderthals, so, so they say, we could anticipate where they were going to be tomorrow. We could be there laying in wait for them, which we did, and slaughter them. Neanderthals couldn't do that. They could not anticipate where the Homo sapiens were going to be. So you start thinking, the lion. Neanderthal knows, lion bad, lion eat me. But the Homo sapien can say, lion bad, lion eat me. And I know that lion likes to hang out over here. So by the way, don't go over here. And usually in the mornings, he's here and here, so don't go over there. So we, as Homo sapiens, have always been able to think and communicate in fiction stories. And that's how we ultimately have built, you know, uh, who we are today. I would argue that storytelling is probably uh, more important for our survival and evolution than our opposable thumbs. It literally stories that have evolved us from cavemen and women to consumers today. So Park, when you talk about predictive, that's where I'm guessing this business of story and storytelling in business comes into play. So if we think about the, the, the early homo sapiens being able to, you know, figure out where the lion was going to be, figure out where the enemy was going to be and predicting that. And then communicate that. And then communicating like that. that. Yep. How, how do you see that? Then I want to hear, hear what you had to say about how does that play into what we do today when we talk about marketing and storytelling and sales? Yeah. Is, is, is that, 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 that predictive thought process is what does it for us? It, it's that. And, you know, I, I'm no Harvard trained PhD evolutionary biologist. I just read enough and I connect enough dots that my belief, and I've tested this with, with others that know much, much more than I do, that because our homo sapien brains in 30,000 years literally have not changed. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's an absolute bat of an eye. And they even say in this book, if you were to run across a homo sapien from 30, 40, 50, 60,000 years ago, they would look just like us today. And in fact, if you put them into our schools, they would end up in a peer on this podcast, Dan, just like you and our, I are today. We are no smarter than them. We just have more experiences that we can relate to. So that tells me, and, and, and I know this a little bit from, from pure brain uh, structure, our, our youngest son had swelling of the brain as a, as a young man, as a young child, and had to undergo some brain surgery to redu reduce that encephalitis. And in doing so, I read everything that I could possibly read and absolutely understand and, you know, actually understand and absorb about the brain, the brain structure, the pressure on it, what it might mean to our young, young man. You know, he was, he was in second grade when we found this out. Um, and so I just studied and I came across so many different uh, resources. The one I really loved is Jonathan Gottschall's The Storytelling Animal, Why Stories Make Us Human. He covers this intersection of story structure and brain structure. Long-winded way of saying it works, not because it is predictive, but it is literally how my arm raises up and down 
It's how our brain mechanics work in making sense of the world. I need a, I need a setup. Okay, give me a context to this communication, the setup that you're telling me. Give me a but, a contradiction, something that is happening that gets my attention that says, I've got to pay attention to this because I'm going to get a payoff. They're going to teach me something that I can learn. Basic, basic story structure is that you and I live vicariously through the heroes and the protagonists in the stories we love so that we can try on their trouble from the safety and comfort of our lounger just so that we can learn what we would do in case what is ever happening to them ever happens to us. It's a basic, basic archetype. So when in the business world, we often want to give them the setup, man, I've got the best storytelling program platform in the world. Do you want to buy it? I want to go just right to the offering in, in the, but we miss act two the contradiction and the conflict as to why in the hell does this matter at all? That's where it comes in in sales. You've got to take the time and use the energy to find that middle ground of what is the contradiction or conflict that my offering is going to help you overcome or help you avoid or help you get around. And now I have a reason and a purpose and a position in this world for you as my audience member to pay attention. Even if consciously they're like, this guy's boring the hell out of me, subconsciously, if you do it right, it snaps to attention and goes, oh my God, you know, Thog from the cave is trying to tell me something, even though it's Bart standing on a stage. <laughs> and I mean, that's, there's a lot to digest there. Um, <laughs> so when you talk about the, the hero, the protagonist, that's what, what I've heard people say. Maybe you can agree with this or you can kind of explain a little bit. The protagonist isn't your company or your solution it should be your potential client right it always is yeah. It there? yeah it always is but in the old days when uh, brands owned the influence of mass media the really smart brands still knew exactly what you talk about there and told stories mm -hmm. but most of the rest of them got lazy and they just inundated you with content and crap without triggering that that mechanism in your mind that says oh they're trying to tell me a story so um so yeah what it the role the brand plays is not the center of the story is not the protagonist it actually plays a more important role and that is the role of mentor or guide okay. so for instance luke skywalker would not achieve anything without Obi-Wan Kenobi by his side or Yoda by his side. Those are the brands that helped him level up and really, you know, empower him to be who he is. Glenda, the good witch of the North was the mentor and guide for Dorothy, but she was the center of the story. So the exact same thing is true with your brand, your audience, anyone that you're trying to communicate with, connect with and move them to action. You have to place them at the center of the story and know that you play actually a more important role of mentor or guide because you're trying to help them get what they want on their journey by providing the right offering at the right time. So how do you think, or how have you seen brands do that really well in telling their story and connecting their story as the mentor to the protagonist and their struggles? How do you make that connection? Yeah, well, you use story first and foremost to do your research, um, just as if you were writing a screenplay. And it is about a drug kingpin from Cuba. I'm just grabbing. But you're not Cuban. You're not even a drug kingpin. But you have to go and research and understand what maybe was the life that he grew up in and what were the dynamics that he was you know, working in so that you as the writer – can be authentic and write, you know, with honesty and passion and, and really understanding the world of your protagonist. Well, the exact same thing is true in the business and brand world. You got to get in and figure out who is that number one audience. Start right there. What is their world about? What journey are they on? What do they really care about? And think about them from a story narrative structure standpoint. What journey are they on? And can Joseph Campbell's hero's journey where are they where where are they in that journey and how can my brand offering step in and help them guide them on their way who does a good job of this you know it's all the same ones everybody talks about because it's so obvious when you start boiling it down nike you know their thing is just do it 
Mm -hmm. They are the, the mentor or guide that helps you find that inner athlete or that inner uh, uh, person that just wants to go get some exercise and it's asking you to be accountable. Get your ass off the couch, just do it, and we're here to help you along the way. Wonderful example. Of course, Apple, the old Apple, I don't think the new Apple does it nearly as well. Mm -hmm. When Jobs was around, brilliant at this. Think different. And we are your guide to help you do that. The product is not the center of the story. You, your individuality and creativity is what it's all about. We just help you express it, help you manifest it. So, you know, those are two often uh, uh, quoted examples because they're really, really good at it. So, Park, is this kind of how your workshops go? <laughs> This is a ton of great information. You, you do you do half day and full day workshops. You you travel all this kind of stuff. Is this what it's like? Is just taking everything you have to offer? Well, what I do is um, sorry if I'm going blah. It's no, it's I'm awesome. Fine. It's I great. Latte and I'm just <laughs> uh, five o'clock at night. It's been a long day. Uh, what I do in my workshops is I make it very conversational and I get our audiences immediately involved. I want to trigger their narrative brain. And so what I ask them to do, Dan, is I you know, do a quick little introduction. Sometimes I share a little anecdote or story, again, to try to get them out of their left brain into a narrative brain. Then I ask them to turn to somebody next to them, and hopefully it's a stranger, and I give them each 90 seconds. And I say, Dan, turn next to the, the woman sitting next to you and tell her why you do what you do. And then she takes notes, and then I say, in the 90 seconds, I got a big clock going. I ask her to do the exact same thing. And then I will ask after three minutes, the audience, who here has a good story? And you may say, Lisa has this incredible story that I just heard. And I say, great, Dan, tell us Lisa's story. Mm -hmm. And then what invariably happens is we get hot, you know, high level generalities of facts and stats that happened in a linear progression, but we don't get a story. So we get a hint of who she is and what she's about, but we don't really get the excitement that you experience because her story now has been turned into more generalized uh, uh, recounting of what's going on. That is like our default brain in business in particular. So then we work that and I take them through and I take an audience through a process called the and, but, and therefore that takes your story and enables you, if you're really good, you get it down between 40 to 50 words you end up with perfect story structure set up with the and, but here's the conflict or contradiction that I'm around to respond to, and therefore here's my answer on how I do that. It becomes literally a one floor elevator pitch that you can then the next time someone says, Dan, what is it you do? You can say in two sentences, this is who I am, what I'm for, and why it matters. And you get people literally to lean into you. And now, another example of this is not a long-winded, uh, epic story you're telling. It's not even a, a, a medium-sized anecdote. It's two sentences set up in setup problem resolution that your audience can immediately connect with because their brain, their limbic brain. So then we grow on that uh, through the sessions. We say, all right, now that you've got the context or theme for your story, let's find an example of a story or some true story well told that support your overall and button there for the theme of your story. Because what will happen when you tell that ABT, people say, God dang, that's cool. Give me an example of what you're talking about. Or, or, or well, well, what do you mean? Because now you've got them hooked. And then you go in and you find a story that you can tell them. And there's five primal uh, elements to that story, a time stamp, a location stamp, a central character. It's often either you or a customer in this case. Um, and now that might go against what we just talked about, about you being the center of the story. But in this case, you are just retelling them a story of something that happened to you that they can relate to. So this is where it gets woo-woo, very meta. <laughs> because now the story you're telling, even though you might be at the center of the story, you're telling them a story that they can relate to, that they can live vicariously through you to understand what they would do in case it ever happens to them. So they are now literally at the center of your story because you were trying to connect with them using story. And then so we talk about how do you do that? How do you spot those? How do you archive them? And then finally, what we do is I take them through the 10-step story cycle system that I developed out of uh, work from Hollywood that I talk about often on uh, the business of story. And that gives them a whole story arc for longer form stories, whether you're cr creating a presentation that you will then 
uh, put in a bunch of these small anecdotes to make your points on, or maybe it's a white paper, or maybe you just want to expand on that example story in a larger version and bring more nuance, then you use those. So it's very much of a small and button, therefore, give me an example of what you're talking about in that and button, therefore, and then when need be, you have the bigger framework to, to uh, talk from. And you're right, I do these in 90 minute uh, keynote presentations. I do them in half day workshops. But one of my most popular offering right now is um, an eight week deliberate practice program where I go in and I will work with a, a company. I can do it in a half day kickoff or sometimes they bring me in for a full day to work with their team. And then they get assignments every week for seven weeks where they're applying what they learn right in their world at in their job and then on week number eight we do either an in-person i come back and work with them or we do a video conference where we bring it all together and we talk to the cohort what worked what didn't work where are you looking for more answers but the thing with all this dan is you got to practice it you got to do it over and over and over again Absolutely. Yeah, you can't just do it, listen to it once, or take the one eight week course and be done with it, Park. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta work it, right? That's the thing. It's hard. Yeah, you know, I default to just blah 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 blah. When and I probably just did it to you right there. Uh, <laughs> we, it's just what we do. Our brains are lazy, and so it's going to take right. the easy way out. And that's not always um, telling stories because it takes work to be able yeah. to do that. And and there seems to be a little bit of a difference, like you said earlier, between story and just facts and figures and a linear progression. There really is a difference. And so we have to work that muscle. I get it. Yeah. 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 And, and I love what you say. You have a headline on your website that says, get any point across with the applied science and bewitchery of story. <laughs> and it sounds like that's what those uh, courses are, are are doing for people. So. Yeah, awesome. it is a left brain, right brain thing. So there's the applied science of it, which is the frameworks that you can use that are proven frameworks that have been used since the beginning of time to excite your audience's brain. And then when you do that, there's the bewitchery you see that happens where people mm -hmm. are just like ignited and become passionate and you can move them to action. But you got to be careful. You want it to use it for good and not evil. Yes. <laughs> because <Amen. it's> yes, <laughs> as effective on either side of that, that chasm. Yeah. I'm into that. Now I want to go back to the beginning of our conversation. You talked about music. You referenced the, the piano behind you. Um, you have played it as we were talking earlier off, off camera or offline, whatever. Um, so what is it that you learned from, from composition, from taking these classes, from, from getting your degree? What did you, what really, what did you learn? How do you apply that into story today? Dan, yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Such a, such a great question. Um, I was no great mathematician growing up, uh, was really struggled with math, and yet music helped me understand math. And you find, especially when you're pulling apart great pieces like Beethoven and Mozart wrote, Bach was another one that I really woke up to. When you started seeing uh, the construction of these masterpieces, you couldn't help, even from a, a math ditz like me, seeing how math plays into everything from the time signature to the rhythm of the piece to when you want to modulate from one key to another, how long that needs to take. You can divide these frames and you can see that these masters were working within a framework of rhythm, of you know this temporal life that we all live in. Life is temporal. It move, we are constantly moving through time. So when I was able to study composition and theory, I could take then a masterpiece or even a short song and I could capture, here's a moment in time that's very temporal and I can see it happening linearly, um, linearly through the math, but then harmonically where it would take you from you know, majors to minors to key changes to relative keys. And I just found a whole rhythm in that that really helped me first and foremost as a writer. Uh, when I first got in the advertising world, I just found that there's a rhythm to everything, including really good writing that I'm always still trying to, to master in this day. And you know, the great masters, writers all have the rhythm to them. And so I just see these tremendous parallels, um, even when it comes down to a website experience to a video, the length of a video, to uh, the lilting rhythm of a narrator's voice. When is too much? When is too little? When do you need to take your audience from this pleasure maybe into a minor key or a minor mode and bring them back up and toggle them between these pluses and minuses, these positives and negatives of your story, which when I started studying um, 
screenwriting, not to be a screenwriter, but where I could use it in advertising and marketing, I found screenwriters did the exact same thing. Um, not necessarily to the point of going and, and, and transposing music and figuring out how it works, but they have pluses and minuses. A, a scene, for instance, can't just happen. They got to think, okay, are we coming in at a high, low, high point in this scene? Therefore, we need to exit on a low point or vice versa. Or does Dan have the control in this scene? And everyone knows that Dan's going to scream at Park, but somehow Park wrestles the moment away from Dan and ends up to have the power moving from the scene. So this is what propels story forward. And it's the same sort of principles that propels music forward. If you want to see it in action, I just watched um, A Star is Born with oh Lady Gaga, gosh. Bradley Cooper. Amazing. Unbelievable. Yes. I mean, the acting, the music, and just how the whole story was put together. Now, the story itself won't blow your mind, but the creation of it and how they produced it and how they delivered it and the acting. And you can see this parallel between the music, if you're really paying attention to it and what's happening on the scene, even if you pay attention to the visual storytelling and how they art directed that piece. That's a really good one that I've seen as of late that combines these, these uh, different worlds of story. Yeah, that one, that one blew me away. I, I mean, I know Lady Gaga is ridiculously talented. Bradley Cooper's been pretty good from what I've seen, but my gosh, yeah. the directing, the writing, the songwriting, everything. Yeah, the editing. Absolutely. Yeah, the cinematography was beautiful. Yeah, yeah I, so, I was really moved. Yeah, some of the, the uh, foreshadowing afterwards was like, oh, okay. I did see that. Didn't exactly know what was coming, but okay, now I get it. Yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. That's a great example. You know, you know uh, musicians way back in the day, uh, there's a thing called text painting, and they would write music to, like Peter and the Wolf is a good example of it, um, but they would use foreshadowing in their music. They would roll out little themes to introduce characters and sometimes throw in a theme that seemed like totally out from left field, but then they'd reintroduce that theme 10 minutes down the road, and you're like, oh, man, okay, <laughs> awesome. Our brain loves that stuff. Yeah. And, and I, I hear part, part of your story is music, screenwriting, writing, all these things come together to help you do this thing called storytelling for businesses and for brands. Mm -hmm. is, is that lifelong learner, curious personality, is that what has helped you become so proficient in this and to be able to teach others? I mean, should other storytellers take that attitude of, I'm just going to learn from everywhere? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's everyone learns a little bit differently. I can tell you, um, I got married when I was 26 and uh, we had three kids right away. And I was trying to build an agency and raise a family and did all that stuff successfully. And I had zero time for expanding my knowledge. And my wife kept saying, you know, you should read more. You should find some time to read more. And I said, I'm so tired. I can't read. <laughs> Um, but as our kids got older and along about 40 years old, when I was 40, early 40s, I started finally finding the time and energy to read more. And then it was a combination of our son who got sick with encephalitis, where I was reading on that of, you know, what's physically is going to happen to us. And then our middle uh, child, who's also a son, was in film school, at Chapman University. This is about 2006, 2000, and graduated in 2010. Um, and I was fascinated, always loved Hollywood, never had the guts to go and do what he did. He's still over there to this day. He just did, uh, directed uh, Red Bull's very first 3D stereoscopic uh, music video. And so if you got the, if you got, what, is, wow. what are the, the Oculus, put it on, it'll yeah. blow your mind. You literally first person walk through this music video. So he's wow. all in. But I was studying uh uh, screenwriting when he was going there because I would said Parker when you're done with your books send them to me when you're done since I'm paying for them because I <laughs> want to know what do they teach you uh, that I could learn and that's when I got totally fascinated by Hollywood screenwriting and started using and applying those techniques while I was still running my own ad agency and we were having a lot of success with it but I found running an agency took me away from my real passion of now understanding how does this work why does this work and how can I share it with more leaders in this world, especially in a world that is so divided, so left, so right, um, that if I could do anything in the next chapter of my career, it's to lessen that division and bring people together, maybe first through uh, businesses, through nonprofit organizations, maybe even through politics of 
being able to understand each other, find the common grounds by using basic intentional story principles to build understanding and empathy, and for me to do a better job of, of, of um, you know, communicating and connecting with people. And so those two worlds, our, our young son's brain structure world and our older son's movie storytelling structure world came together for me. Uh, they're both doing magnificently, by the way. I'd like to. That's awesome. But I think it was just that personal uh, connection to all of that that really got me out of the old thing of being an ad agency to what I do today. Yeah. So it's not too late. I'm in my early forties. It's not too late. Oh, no. I can still no, learn. No, no. <laughs> you know, I did it when I was 55. I, I made That's my awesome. big, big change. I shut down my agency, uh, 55 and people thought I was crazy. I had my, my brother <laughs> who said, what happened, man? What's wrong? <laughs> and I just said, I didn't like it anymore. Well, why didn't you sell it? I said, because then I'd still be strapped to it. You know, I couldn't go out. I'd be there for five years and yeah, I'd make some money, but then I would be under someone else's thumb. I said, I wanted to, literally divorce myself from it and start anew and give me my off ramp. And I to tell you, it's been a blast. I teach it, wrote and taught a curriculum at Arizona State University on storytelling in their school yeah. sustainability. I work with the U.S. Air Force with their brigadier to four-star generals um, routinely two to three times a year out at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C., uh, Lackland down in San Antonio to help teach them about storytelling and leadership and how they can connect with their young airmen and women coming in. Um, and big brands, small brands alike, and my job is to help people live into their most powerful stories by first getting clear on what their story is. So you can do it at any age. I'm living proof. Yeah. And any venue, any area, any niche, any like, you know, Air Force to, I mean, everything that you're talking about, storytellers can do that. Like I would have never have thought military for storytelling and leadership. I mean, leadership, obviously, but I wouldn't have thought of that. So that's, man, that is fascinating. What do you so have uh, in direct common and you as a ubiquitous you, what do we all have in common with that four-star general sitting out in Washington, D.C. in the Pentagon? We all, we all need to be able to connect. We're homo sapiens. Right. Yeah. There Our go. brains function the exact same way. Yeah. We have different experiences. We have different intellectual levels on what we like to study. We have different passions. But the basic uh, mechanism of creating uh, meaning out of the madness of being human is sits at the top of our brain stem, and it is driven by story. Yeah. Man. Uh, Amazing. It's great. And there's a really good book by um, Jonathan Haidt called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by uh, Religion and Politics. And he has one of my all-time favorite quotes in there. And he says, our brains are not logic processors. They're story processors. Mm. You know, everything we bring in, we make a story up about, and then we try to proof it through our logic. When was the last time you were bored into buying anything? Right. Maybe tires. Because you had to. <laughs> Right. But other than that, you're buying with emotion and stories trigger emotion. And then you justify that purchase with your logical brain. Um, Robert McKee, who is a legendary screenwriting coach from Hollywood. I went to his four day story course over at the LAX Sheridan in 2011. I think it was our son Parker and I went, I gave it to him for a Christmas present. He went for his work in Hollywood. I went for my work in the rest of the world of marketing and, uh, if you ever get a chance, it's a real treat to go and listen to Robert McKee for four days. But he said something I thought was really telling too. He said, you know, our conscious mind is simply the PR department for our subconscious mind where all the real decisions are being made. Hmm. So that just speaks to, and I've had him on my show a couple times and he's a, he's a really fun guy to interview, but boy, that guy knows story, movie making, screenwriting inside and out. Um, hmm. And it just keeps kind of, proofing back to what I've been learning and what I've read and the people I've had a chance to meet and talk to in this world about story. Yeah. Oh, very powerful. Great stuff, man. I'd say this, this has been absolutely a pleasure park. I appreciate you taking the time. If, before I let you go though, if, if I could, if somebody said to you, all right, park, you're done, you're done being a professional storyteller. You can't tell any more stories. What would you go out on? What kind of a story would you tell? What story would it be? What would it look like? How would you end your storytelling persona? Oh my God. <laughs> Hopefully um, I would become somehow and magically an Olympic snow skier because I absolutely love snow skiing. And I said, you know what? 
I'm not teaching story anymore. If you want to find me, I'll be up on the slopes or in the bar and we'll share a beer and have a story there. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> that, I, that's such a great question, Dan. I don't know how yeah. that was the first thing that popped into mind. Now you're going to make me think about that all night long. That sounds like a great story. If you think of anything different, it should be a message, <laughs> but that was a great story. And if you do want to go skiing, uh, Michigan isn't the best place for skiing, but yeah. you know, we have winter here, so come on up. You do. Uh, you you have some some good some uh, Olympic skiers come out of Wisconsin, I believe, didn't you? Yeah. 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 Up, yep. Which is not too far from the what we call the UP, the Upper Peninsula. Right. Uh, right. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So <laughs> great, well, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Total. Totally a pleasure. Uh, what's the best place for people to connect with you? And we'll put yeah. some show note links, but sure. Come on over and visit me at businessofstory.com. And or if you are looking for a keynote speaker or workshops, you can also go to my speaking site and see me in action there and what people think about my work. And it's just simply my name, parkhowell.com. So either one of those two locations. Awesome, man. We'll put those in the show notes and of course, link to the show as well. If you want to want to subscribe to another show, that's this is a great one to go as a business of story. So thanks, Park. Thanks for having me, Dan. So yeah, thank you once again to my guest, Park Howell. Uh, be sure to visit him online. Check out the Business of Story, uh, the podcast, the website. Check out his personal uh, site as well as a speaker. Park is just uh, a fantastic guy who really enjoys helping others and teaching. So go check out all of his content. And you can find all those links to those resources in the show notes. And hey, if you joined, if you enjoyed the episode here of, of, of Park and me just kind of uh, conversing and having a great time, uh, share it anywhere you can, right? Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, share it with other storytellers so it can inspire the world around us. I appreciate those shares very much. Uh, and if you're new, text the word storytellers to 3196 to subscribe today. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers.